Today, I'm going to be talking, as Matt said, about aphasia emulation, realism, and the Turing test. And what I would like to do today is actually start off with a little bit of background of how we got to the research that I'm going to be, the new work that I'm going to be talking about today. So if you were to go to a foreign country, it's likely that you won't speak the local language. If you go to Spain, you might not speak Spanish. If you go to Russia, you might not speak Russian. If you go to Japan, you might not speak Japanese. However, this is socially acceptable. There's no real expectation that a traveler would speak the local language. People can empathize, they understand what it's like to be in that situation, and they'll still try to help you out and sell you something. But now imagine that the city that you're in is your hometown. And the language that you can't speak or understand is your native tongue. Well, this is the situation for over one million adults in America who have aphasia. Here is a picture, a picture and a text sample. This was said by someone who has aphasia. And as you can see here, uh, this, person has ha uh, this person has highly distorted speech. Um, there's words that aren't English. There's some awkward pauses. The grammar is slightly distorted. But if you look at what the person is actually saying, they conceptually understand what's going on in this picture. And that's because aphasia is an acquired language disorder. It doesn't affect cognitive functioning of that individual. However, many friends and family have difficulty making this distinction uh, because interacting with adults who have aphasia can actually be quite challenging. And as a result, friends and family often avoid contact with individuals who have aphasia because they just find it so challenging. And this lack of social interaction greatly impacts quality of life. Now, at this point, you might be saying, well, Josh, you know, I don't really care about quality of life. I'm, I'm sure that they're going to a doctor or a speech pathologist. They're getting treatment. They'll, they'll be getting better soon enough. But in reality, when practitioners, doctors and speech pathologists don't empathize, don't understand uh, the condition that someone is in, quality of care suffers as well. So that brings us to a really challenging question. How do we learn to empathize? How can we teach someone empathy? And if you think of that old adage, walk in someone else's shoes, um, that's exactly what we did. We built the Aphasic Characteristic Emulation Software, or ACES. Um, ACES is an IM client that allows users to, who do not have aphasia to experience aphasic distortions firsthand. Uh, this is a screenshot from our paper that we presented at CHI last year. Um, and what you should basically be getting from this is that one of our participants uh, with the name Apple 36 is having their text distorted um, and their conversation partner Jet 587 is having a lot of difficulty understanding the, the communication that's going on. Now ACES is grounded and built off of literature and cognitive psychology and speech and hearing science to create a probabilistic model that distorts the text. And this is a screenshot of the model editor. Um, and in this interface, a researcher or a user can actually set the severity and, if you will, the flavor, the type of aphasia that's being manifested. And I don't really have time to go into how we're doing all of these distortions, the, the individual uh, NLP elements that we're bringing into it. It's sort of outside of the scope of this work. But I wanted to show you that you can actually configure ACES to do a lot of different severities and types of aphasia. So in our CHI paper, we presented a study with 64 participants. 32 of them were experts in aphasia, and 32 of them were from the general community. And what we saw for all of our quanti quantitative data basically looked like this where people in the control group saw almost no real change in empathy or understanding. Um, and people in the treatment group said, yeah, this really does increase my empathy and understanding. I mean, these are highly significant. And this made no difference depending on what the background. So you really didn't need to have prior experience about what aphasia was to see an impact. <clears throat> and we saw the same thing qualitatively. Uh, this is a quote from someone in the informed group, someone who knew about aphasia ahead of time, and they said, listen, I've learned about stuff in the classroom, but this is completely different. This has really changed the way I think about it. And we saw the same thing from people who knew nothing about aphasia. They said this was an incre incredibly eye-opening experience. I really learned a lot. So up to this point, we have a model of aphasic distortions that we built. And we know that it builds empathy and understanding. But the thing that we haven't done up to this point is determined, are these errors that we're in interjecting into the text realistic? 
Is it believable, the type of distortions that we're making? Does it actually look like aphasia? And that's the problem that we were addressing in our paper and that I'll focus on for the rest of this talk. So what we did is we wanted to show participants text samples and have them make judgment calls about those text samples on whether or not they were aphasic or you know, came from a computer or came from a human. So we had 48 text samples that we were using. Half of them were generated by a human. So this was taken from transcripts or publications about aphasia. And half of them were uh, generated by our computer system called ACES. But what kind of question, what kind of judgment call do we want these pe our participants to make? And we actually asked two different questions. We asked, the, um, we basically ran two experiments, if you will. We did an aphasia, aphasia Turing test where we asked participants to make a binary judgment call. In this text sample, tell me, does it come from a human or does it come from a computer? And the other uh, experiment, the other question that we asked was, how human is it? How realistic are the errors that, that you're seeing? And in this experiment, instead of telling our participants you know, that, they could that the text samples could come from a human or come from a computer, we actually lied. We said, we want you to help us make our algorithms better. All of the text samples that you see are going to come from a computer, so look at the errors and tell us how realistic they are. But in reality, it was a 50-50 split. So it was slightly different. Now, this type of question is pretty hard for a general person to answer. And so we really had to choose our demographic appropriately. And we recruited 24 participants from speech and hearing science. And if you acknowledge that this is a community which is steeped in language disorders, their profession deals with diagnosis and categorization, um, these are really experts. We wanted to set the bar really high for the people who would be making these judgment calls. Now at this point, you're probably saying, well, Josh, I understand how you got the human samples, but how did you generate the computer samples that you used? Well, every computer sample starts off as a human sample. From the human text, from the transcript that we used, we could generate an original sample, where we basically tried to undistort the, the, the text that people would see and get at the heart of what somebody was trying to say. At the same time, we created a profile in ACES of that person. We had multiple text samples from the same individual, so we were able to use ACES, adjust those sliders that I showed you before, to try to emulate the specific types of errors that that person was making. And then we applied the original sample in the human profile and generated a computer, uh, computer sample. And I want to make it very, very clear here. There was no cherry picking. As soon as we generated the human profile and we generated the list of original samples, everything that came out the other end of ACES, we used. The first thing that came out, we did not choose the best thing. We did not rerun these text samples. So let me just quickly show you what this process looked like. So if you talk, start off with this human sample, um, uh, somebody talking about the Little Red Riding Hood story, you can see the errors that are there. We then got, created our original sample, which gets to the heart of what the person's saying. We tried to keep it roughly the same length, the same general sentence structure. And then here are the distortions that our software applied to uh, make it emulate aphasia. So at this point, we had 48 human samples and 48 computer samples. And we wanted to ensure that no, uh, no text sample is used more than once. So we randomly selected whether or not a text sample would be using the human side or the computer side. So no participant would ever see the same text sample in the two different conditions. And once again, there was no cherry picking here. This was done completely randomly. Now, the one last thing I need to talk about uh, in, in terms of our methodology was that we actually used two different types of aphasia, um, anomic and agrammatic. And the reason that we did this is because um, aphasia can affect many different parts of language. And anomic aphasia and agrammatic aphasia generally affect two different parts. Um, anomic, you can think about it simply as it affects the content of the sentences, the words. And agrammatic effect, aphasia affects the grammar or the structure of sentences. So, Here's a quick text sample from someone who has anomic aphasia. And as you can see, I've highlighted in red where this person is having difficulty coming up with the right vocabulary. They have awkward pauses as they're trying to search for the right term. They try to describe the term instead of actually saying it. And in some situations, they just make up vocabulary. They're non-word errors. Here's a quick text sample from someone who has agrammatic aphasia. Highlighting, once again, the errors that they are making. You can see verb conjugation issues. You can see pronoun issues, where they're using the wrong pronoun, or tense issues. Um, so this is uh, the difference. 
Now, I've thrown a lot at you right now. So to quickly summarize, we had 48 text samples. 24 of them are being used for our Turing test, and 24 of them are being used in the How Human test. There was no uh, repetition between the two conditions. Within each of these, half came from a computer, and half of them came from a human. And within that, six of them were anomic, and six of them were agrammatic. Because we had 24 participants in our study, that means that we had 144 observations at the lowest level of this, this structure for our comparisons. So now to discuss the results, I'm going to start off with the first experiment, which was the aphasia Turing test. So just as a reminder, we showed participants a text sample, one per page, and we said, is this human or is this computer? And this is what we saw. Um, for the text samples that actually came from a human, people were right about 50% of the time. And for text samples that came from a computer, people were right in terms of labeling it around 53% of the time. It's just slightly better than chance. Um, and to look for statistical difference, um, because we have repeated measures, uh, each participant has multiple data points, we couldn't use something like a Fisher's exact test. So instead we used a generalized estimating equations based off of a logistic regression, because we're dealing with binary data. And what we saw here was a p-value of 0.46. Um, but you can look at this and see, you know, these are basically the same. I mean, people were equally good or equally bad at determining the origin of these text samples. But now let's break it down by the two different subtypes of aphasia that we looked at. First, anomic, which is looking at the content words of the sentences. And here you see that the, um, the humans uh, labeling was about 60%. They labeled text samples that came from a person about 60% of the time. And for the text samples that came from a human, it was about 54% of the time. And we did not see statistically, this was not statistically different. But even with the 60% accuracy, that's still not really that good. Right? I mean, that, that's still just only slightly better than, than flipping a coin. I mean, a little bit more. Now, when you look at the agrammatic text samples, um, this is uh, where the structure, the grammar of the sentence was distorted. We saw the humans, people were actually labeling it 40% of the time correctly. That's less than half. That means our participants were really bad at identifying the text samples that came from a person. And when you look at the text samples that came from a computer, they were around 53% as well. And this was statistically different. So overall, from the Turing test, what we basically see is, you know, there's no real, people are getting about 50% right. Um, for the anomic text samples, they're not, we're not really seeing that much of a difference. And the, in the agrammatic text samples, people can't label the human correctly. They can't even identify the, the human, let alone the computer. So let's move on to the how human test, which is the second set of questions that we were asking participants. And as a reminder, we showed participants one text sample and we asked them to make a judgment call on how human the distortions were. And in this one, remember, we lied to our participants. We really wanted to get them away from the overt gotcha game of, aha, I figured out which one's the computer. And we really wanted them to focus on the error. So we said everything is coming from a computer, even though in reality it was 50-50. And here's what we saw. So for the text samples that originated from a human, people rated it 2.9 which is just on the human side of right in the middle of our Likert scale. And for the computer uh, assessments, we had, people were rating 3.05, just barely on the side of the computer rating uh, in the middle of that Likert scale. And because we have linear um, uh, scalar data for this assessment, we used a GEE with a linear regression. And of course, remember, lack of statistical significance doesn't mean that there isn't a difference between the two groups. And because we have linear uh, scalar data this time, we were actually able to use Rita and Ekholm's uh, statistical measure of similarity. And this looks at the distribution of the two different data sets and sees if they are statistically similar. And here we saw that they are. Basically, there is no statistic. There, there, these two data sets, uh, these two sets of observations are statistically the same. So when we break it up into the anomic text samples, what we see is people actually were rating about a quarter of a point uh, towards human on our Likert scale, 2.73. And for the computer samples, it was about a quarter of a point on the computer side, saying that these are about a quarter of a Likert point towards being more computer. And even though these are statistically different, if you think about it, no one here is really saying, yes, I know for sure that that is a human sample, that is a computer sample. These, 
the, these scores are still hovering right around the center of our five-point Likert scale, which means that even when there was a, a difference, you know, people aren't so, super, super confident. They aren't saying, this is really human, this is really a computer. When we look at the agrammatic text samples, we actually see something that parallels the Turing test study. For the human text samples, the, the ones that came from a human, people actually rated them to look like they came from a computer. And for the uh, human, uh, the ones that actually did come from a computer, they made them look like uh, they thought they came from a human. Um, once again, you know, we're still hovering right around that middle scale, but this is really pretty interesting. So overall, when we look at the, uh, the results of this how human test, um, we, we, we see that pretty much people make an overall, uh, these are believable. They're, they're right in the middle of between human and computer. And more interestingly, when you look at the anomic and agrammatic, even, when the, even though that there are differences, we're still hovering right around that middle, uh, that middle line of 3.0 on that five-point Likert scale. So what we set out with today was to look at how realistic and believable the distortions and errors that we create with ACEs are. Um, and we did this through two different types of experiments. We did a Turing test, as well as a how human uh, scalar test. And what we basically ended up seeing was that these are believable distortions. Um, experts in the field that look at diagnosis of aphasia and deal with uh, categorization of this disorder really can't tell a difference. And, you know, these results are actually quite cool. I mean, in some respects, we kind of passed a Turing test here. And more interestingly, this strengthens the results from our Kai paper because this says the empathy and the knowledge that these people were feeling after do, using our software was not just any empathy, it was not just any knowledge, but it was actually knowledge about this dis specific disorder that we were targeting. But where do you go from here? What's the next step? What, is, what are the future implications of this work? And that, I think, is where this starts to get really cool. Um, so the first direction that I foresee is looking at emulating other things. And I'm not just talking about other types of speech disorders, but I think we can expand this to something much more broadly usable, which is like English as a second language. I mean, I hear undergraduate students at multiple in uh, institutions say, oh, that TA or that professor is horrible. Or you hear somebody in a company say, yeah, that guy at that lab in that other country, they're horrible, they're so hard to work with. When in reality, these people are brilliant. You know, I mean, professors are brilliant. And, well, I want a job, so I have to say that. Um, and, um, but, you know, in many situations, this is actually because of the language barrier. A lot of these individuals don't understand, can empathize with the challenges of communicating in a language that isn't your native tongue. So what if we created a English as a second language emulation to build empathy in a work environment or in a classroom environment? And another application is actually reversing the distortions. And I'm not saying that we're going to ever get to be perfect and to completely like translate someone who has aphasia into undistorted speech. But even if we can use the techniques that I developed in ACEs, couldn't we get that a little bit closer? If we could provide some kind of additional help for conversation partners in terms of clearing up what someone is trying to say, this might still, if you will, grease the wheels of communication just a little bit. So at this point, um, I would like to thank all of my co-authors, um, but also I'd like to encourage you to go to aphasia.es. ES is for emulation software, not Spain. Um, and, you know, because we are posting all of our work there, and we're also going to start posting some of our data sets up there as well, if people want to look at the data that we've been collecting. And I'll thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you.